everybody. Welcome to the first day of the Refraction and Water and Music Summit. Very excited to be here today to moderate this chat on Web3 for Whom, where we will be discussing the role that Web3 plays on creating global infrastructure for new creative practices. Uh, I think this is a very interesting time to be having this discussion, given everything that's going on in the space right now. And it's super important that we make the time to take a step back and ask ourselves these really fundamental questions that we're about to go through. Uh, so yeah, on that note, I will introduce our amazing panelists who are all really important people in the Web3 ecosystem and all touch culture and creative practice in different ways. So I will start with Abby. Uh, Avi is a Nigerian-American multidisciplinary artist and curator who experiments with technology to explore the experience of being a black woman in contemporary society. She works with a variety of applications and media, including photography, digital and analog video, and 3D modeling, and began minting NFTs in February 2021. Abby recently curated the Paradise exhibition featuring 22 black women in celebration of Women's History Month that was featured on CNN International's Inside Africa episode about NFTs. She is a member of Accelerate Art and Friends with Benefits and part of the operations team for the African NFT community, which is an incubator that advocates for African artists by giving them the tools to break down barriers and spread their influence across the world. To Abby's left, we have Nicholas G. Padilla, Nicholas G. Padilla is a DJ, music producer, independent researcher, and interdisciplinary artist born and raised in Miami. A solid participant in the city's experimental club scene, his roots are Taino and his lineage is from Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Venezuela. He is a co-founder of Miami Community Radio, which is an online radio platform and DAO built to support Miami's community radio, uh, creative talent through innovative infrastructural equity. He has performed at ICA Miami's First Fridays and Three Points Music Festival, contributed art and poetry to the Islandia Journal, exhibited artwork for art clubs group show, and exhibited an audio-visual installation entitled Spectral Influence. He has also performed along Bjork, One Oh Tricks Point Never, Dorian Concept, Jalen, Actress, and many more. And then, we have, to Abby's right, Steph Guerrero. Steph has worked in the music industry for over 10 years. The majority of her experience comes from working at major record labels, Sony Music and Universal Music Group, in addition to other large entertainment companies. She has been integral in establishing onboarding standards, content development frameworks, digital promotional structures, and best practices for artists, record labels, radio stations, streaming platforms, and other content channels. Most recently, she founded Goat for Mars, a consulting firm in the development, marketing, and community building of Web3 music projects. She also manages artist relations for Telly, a platform that allows creators to easily create token-gated websites for every project. Last but not least, we have Jack Vaca, who is a senior manager of ecosystem enablement at Polygon Studios. She also heads community at Genre, which is a Web3 branch of Leaving Records, and advises on dance and community for Heat. And I am your moderator and fearless leader into the conversation. Uh, I'm a creative producer and brand strategist uh, focusing on emerging tech and culture and social good, and I also program a music festival called Mutech. So, uh, I wanna actually kind of get into the conversation today by answering the question that this panel seeks to ask, which is, Web3 for whom? So, I would love for all of you to kind of think about this and tell us who is currently Web3 serving? Who is Web3 for right now? And from your various perspectives, does it feel like an equal playing field? So, maybe we'll start with you, Jack. Yeah, sure. Um, is Web3, who is Web3 for right now? Right now it is for a tiny, tiny percentage of people who have the resources, the time, and the bandwidth to get into it. So we are not doing a very good job 
with being inclusive. So <laughs> long story short, I guess um, it was created by a very small few uh, group of people who had the money and resources and all of these things to uh, develop this concept in this area, but um, who it should serve is everyone. Uh, that's definitely something that I strongly believe in and I will dive into it more, but I'm curious to hear the other uh, folks. Yeah, I'm gonna agree with that. I, I feel like Web3 in theory is for everyone, but in practice and at least the noise that is being generated from a lot of the headlines and what, what's getting attention, it's basically the same people that usually get all of the attention, which is generally cis, white, males, um, and also people with a lot of money. So that's that's what's happening currently, but it is a, a utopia idea, ideal. Um, I would say Web3 is definitely more for the Western world and more like catered towards the Western world um, because there are like things like crypto bans or like restrictions in different countries and even some marketplaces in some countries, um, artists can access it without having to go like a roundabout way. So definitely the Western world, but then even in the Western world, it's uh, people with money and like a very small group of people. Yeah, these are all incredible points that were made. Um, each one of them has a lot of truth in it. I would say, uh, who is it for? I'd say it is for everyone, but we have these deconstructions of, you know, what kind of finance? Is it refi? Is it DeFi? Is it CFI? What demographic is being uh, catered towards? What kind of technologies are being deployed and for what reason? I remember when Ripple first launched and it was like, this is scary as hell. Like, um, so yeah, I mean, to each his own, I think uh, this is compatible with ideologies and philosophies and we should be inclusive, uh, even if it's suits or corporate people um, that are trying to extract, um, that'll eventually be washed away at some point and what is good shall prevail, in, in my opinion. But I think it is for everyone, yeah, yeah. I'm seeing a pattern in your responses. <laughs> uh, and I think it's great that we're gonna chat about all of those things today, um, and you all bring up really valid points. So all of you work in Web3 in different capacities. I would love to hear more about the, some of the projects that you're doing in the space and how these projects are potentially, it doesn't even have to be projects, it could be your own work or your own sort of like personal identity in the space, work to kind of challenge this uh, lack of inclusiveness and diversity. Uh, yeah, I'll go first. Um, well, uh, it's kind of a big one too, because at Polygon we have a huge ecosystem. And so part of my job is ecosystem enablement. And one of the projects that I'm working on is uh, I just really love people having their own resources to create their own destiny. I mean, that's like maybe the blockchain idealist in me. So one of the things that I'm thinking about and working on cross, like cross department and throughout the whole company is uh, gathering all of our resources in our various decentralized <laughs> organization and creating a product that, around it where people can find the support that they need. And it's an all-encompassing thing. It's not just the technical stuff. It's also, you know, my background is in community building and community strategy, so like all of the resources that I have built is also on, on serve for this ecosystem. Moreover though, what I really want to do is find a way to support people with a VC networks. And so that's one of the things that I'm working on as well because, you know, it's, it's such a big ecosystem. We want to be able to help everyone but we can't, so how do we offer these tools for themselves so people that can find these, these, uh, these resources for themselves? And a lot of my work personally is centered around inclusion, diversity, and all of these things that we preach about, but I'm an indigenous queer <laughs> like femme, so I, I live it too. So it's so important to have these voices early because I can tell you that that's on the forefront of my mind when I'm creating these uh, systems and these resources. It's just necessary and we need people that are thinking about the ways that people are oppressed so that we can unblock. So that's what I'm doing at Polygon. <laughs> that sounds really exciting. Um... So I would say on the Telly side, the reason I joined Telly and it took me a really long time before I joined any organization was because 
I was seeing a pattern where artists were building up platforms, and that's what I did my whole career. You know, I had artists, everyone flocked to Facebook, make a Facebook account, everyone flocked to Spotify, make your Spotify account, teach your fans how to use Spotify, and let's do that. And then what ended up happening is these things became giants because on the backs and the support of all these artists, and there was no support. So what, what I love about Telly is that it allows the artists to build a world around them and not necessarily around the platform. Um, you can mint wherever you want and do whatever you want. So I'm really excited about artists just building that and making sure that they are the sun in their, you know, solar system of Web3 and what they're doing. Um, that's on that side. And then personally what I'm doing, and I don't know if this is like my personal brand, but I'm kind of opening up all of the information that I know and that I've learned throughout my career. And I'm very honest with artists and, and I tell them everything that I've learned. You know, like, yes, a label will take a huge cut, but what are they giving you other than just money? Because these new business models are popping up where our, people are offering artists money. Like, hey, give me a little bit of equity of ownership in you, but what are you actually getting for that money? Especially if you're giving away a significant percentage of your, your ownership. Um, and so I want to make sure that artists are prepared and they know all the lessons that I've learned, everything that I've seen in the industry that has happened, and not necessarily tell them not to go a certain route, but at least to know that, hey, if you go down this route, this is what I've seen before, so just watch out. Um, <clears throat> in my personal art, I talk about you know, my life as a black woman. I've like touched on colorism. I've touched on like the effects of co um, colonization on Nigeria specifically, um, because that is where my family is from and the effects that it has on how women are treated today. Um, and then also I've, or I organized our Women's um, History Month show, which had 22 black women in Africa and like in the diaspora, just black women in general. Um, and then I, one thing I wanted to make sure was that the women would keep 100% of the funds that they made from the sales. So we went with Zora because they take 0%. And so it's just like providing opportunities for women, but also making sure women get paid um, is very important to me. Um, and then, of course, the African NFT community, we're always making sure we have a presence at all the major crypto um, events like NFT NYC. Um, and like Cyberbot is another um, African group and we were in Art Dubai and we've been in like Senegal. So we've just been making sure that there's a presence so that people realize that there's a lot of talent um, in Africa and you just can't ignore it because we're just, we're gonna be there basically. Yeah, um, when it comes to what we're building as a community at MCR, Miami Community Radio, um, it's more on a local level and providing a lot of solutions that government agencies, um, billionaire class uh, individuals, high net worth individuals, uh, even multimillionaire uh, class individuals may not have any interest in, you know, in deploying these solutions, but uh, we kind of have a bit of a Trojan horse approach towards what we're building out, uh, which includes mutual aid, document sharing. Um, just as an example, we asked all of our residents this past Sunday, like, who knows what a W-9 is? Who knows what an invoice is? And only three or four people raised their hand out of 30, and it's like, what the hell is going on here, right? So that information it needs to be shared and disseminated. I've already uploaded my template with my personal invoice in W-9. Uh, like, what's a tech writer? What's a hospitality writer? Like, so if we're able to do that with 100 people in the city, we're gonna see a huge change. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, you know, also catering to Web3 culture and, um, you know, you mentioned VCs earlier, but what kind of VCs? Like, I've been talking to investment clubs and the intentions aren't really there and, yeah, we prefer like the refraction grant route or like the lens protocol grant route. And so like building is very, um, very delicate when we're creating solutions. And so at least what we're doing with MCR, we're just creating a media platform that's owned by the community uh, through a membership token. So all the residents actually own the station. Um, and yeah, just disruptive technology in general for nightlife uh, broadcasting. And that's what we're offering uh, Miami. So yeah. Awesome, thanks for sharing. Uh, Nicholas, you said the word localized, which I think is really interesting yeah. for this discussion. And um, I've been thinking a lot about this too and how this creative community that is emanating from Web3, sometimes it can often feel really siloed by geographical borders. 
and cultures and communities. So right now, does it feel like Web3, the, the creative community within Web3 is a global sort of like platform? Does it feel collectivist in this way that transcends borders? Or does it feel like we still need to do a lot of work in that space? And I'm wondering also how your experiences have been working in the space in terms of how Web3 has kind of eradicated those borders and eliminated cultural barriers as well? It's a big question. So. I think your mic is off. Oh, no, my mic is on, I'm sorry. Um, what, what, um, could so you repeat the first is, part because it was quite of a long question. Yes. Is, is the web, does it feel right now like this creative community that is emanating from Web3, does it feel global or siloed? Well, we have a lot of work to do in general. We were so early. <laughs> I thought we were going to make it. I know, I know. <laughs> I, was, I told myself I wasn't going to say that, but it's true. Like, we're just emerging. We have so much work everywhere to do. We are not even close. Not even close to... We have little tiny pinpoints of where people are finding pockets, you know, Fortunately, we have people doing the hard work and going to these places that, you know, South America, uh, you know, APAC region, Africa, like we have people that are in there doing the most work that they can, but overall we need a whole bunch of work in the space. It, it is global in that there are these pinpoint little areas throughout the globe, but in whole, we're, we're pretty, we're pretty, we're not there yet. We, we won't be there until we have uh, some sort of uh, like resource allocation that people can actually enjoy the benefits and learn about it at their own pace and find the ways that they want to make their own way in this space. Uh, yes, to your point, not all VCs are good. Let's, let's be real. But if someone needs that because they're developing a game because engineers are expensive, you know, they should be able to find that funding and vibe with whoever they're <laughs> getting money from. But, um... It's, it's, it's global, but only on the surface. Yeah, I, I want to say a few things. So I've mostly worked in Latin America a lot, of, a lot of the time. So I'm used to there being silos and then at the same time being all bunched up together. And that's what happens often in times in Latin America is that we a lot of people assume that because something is popular in one country, that means that all the countries is popular and that doesn't always happen. Um, so I feel, I feel like that's kind of what's happening in Web3, whereas like, yes, there's like a global kind of consensus and some borders are being erased, but not really. You know, there's like still, still clear division. Uh, one of the things that I think it's a huge issue is that a lot of the resources and materials are only available in English or in languages that are not accessible for other countries. So that's, that's definitely gonna be the first barrier of entry. The second one is that a lot of the places where you can acquire crypto, they either like, compare the value of the crypto to the US dollar or euros, which again, compared to any Latin American currency, it's like completely different and it's way harder to earn a dollar in, in a South American currency. So I feel like those are things that we're not taking into account. And then when it comes to IRL events, getting a visa to enter here in the US is very, very difficult to people in, in South America. There are artists that are incredible and they just cannot get approved because unfortunately immigration is not the best kind of situation. So those are things that are still gonna exist in Web3 and Web3 has not been able to resolve. So I would say, yes, there's a certain sense that there's like a globalization of, of economies, but at the same time, these issues are still existing. Um, I would say for me personally, it is very global, but that's because I deal with people from many different countries. And but I also go outside of like my African community and interact. But not everyone does that. Some people like to stay in their little bubbles. So definitely, we need to work on that. And I agree about the languages as well. Um, and like I mentioned, crypto bans and you know, if there's a way to provide funding or resources for people who have a harder time. Um, getting access to crypto, I think we need to work on that. Yeah, I, I agree um, to your point, uh, actually. Like user interface, like GUIs are really important, um, especially when it comes to mass adoption. Like 
uh, we can't assume for people to log on like Uniswap or SushiSwap or Fanking Swap and know how to, you know, because um, obviously launching on a DEX is cheaper than launching on Coinbase or anything that's insured. It's like two, three million dollars to do an IPO nowadays. Um, so yeah, I think the barrier of entry of like new users and like mass adoption is a huge part of uh, kind of where things are headed, especially in our context as MCR, because um, in our case we have a lot of crypto skeptics um, that are also very talented musicians. And so how do we uh, show them that this has to do with autonomy, this has to do with sovereignty, this has to do with ownership of data, um, this has to do with non-nationally backed currencies, uh, this has to do with post banking structures and post-capitalism and post-socialism and post-communism, um, and that the implications behind this technology are very profound for future generations. So I think education is a huge part of making something global, local, um, and if you overcomplicate stuff, people just tune out, and that's it. So um, that's been a fun game to play with residents at MCR. Um, kind of like oversimplifying very complex processes and, you know, not talking about like the comparison between Arbitrum and Metis and, Poly, you know, not, not going that deep into the back end of layer two solutions and things like that, but just saying, hey, we're looking at these solutions um, and whichever one's easier for us to, to use for our tech, right? So, uh, yeah, I think education from global to local is really important, yeah. Those are all really great points. And Steph and Abby, I love how you both brought up language. Uh, something that I've been thinking about recently is about uh, decentralizing language for that very reason. And uh, often when we look at vocabulary or narratives around Web3, it can be extremely kind of Western or through a, a lens that feels very kind of Eurocentric. Um, and I think that language ultimately is at the root of our common understanding of, of just about anything. So those are really great points. Um, I want to kind of flip that on its head now and uh, turn this into um, a more of a forward thinking round of answers. Uh, so I hear what all of you are saying. It seems like um, there is opportunity for the creative ecosystem within Web3 to be more global, to be more kind of like cross-border. What are some strategies or what are some ways that we can work together or be better and uh, try to create and support one another in a way that feels more universal. Like, yeah, I feel like it's perfect that you asked this at a creator uh, panel because I feel like art is the thing that's going to break borders and touch people's hearts and want to dive deeper. So I think that's, that's truly where we will find the success. And I'm always thinking about like, who are the people we aren't seeing the art from, too? And so I'm hoping that Web3 will unlock those smaller artists that I would never otherwise have. Uh, I mean, it's already kind of unlocked so much art that I would never otherwise be so immersed in in this space. Um, but I'm excited to see even more from people that I would ordinarily never, ever get a chance to see. So I think that's how people will you know, come together really, you know, what if you see like a piece of art from someone that you, you know, some marginalized community and maybe someone in middle America, you know, cis straight white person is like, wow, I really resonate with that. You know, you, these connections you, are so random and so um, uh, unpredictable that I just love the idea of that chaos. And so I want to allow that chaos to happen by enabling people to, <laughs> to create and, and, and touch people's lives. Something that happens in music, and I don't know how many people are aware of this, is that um, each listener, depending on where they are located geographically, they're assigned a different value. So a stream that comes from a person listening in Mexico is worth less money than someone coming here in the US is worth like that. And it, 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 it's just because of Spotify's business model, of course, because they cannot charge 10 US dollars to someone living in Mexico. But I think solving that problem where people hold different values, because it, it seems kind of messed up that because you're not in the US, you're worth less. Um, I think that's, that's kind of something that excites me about Web3 and finding a space where 
a listener or the experience of music is valued the same no matter where you are in the world. And I, that's, that's something that's really exciting to me. And the same thing happens with royalty collection. If you're a musician, you have to go through different layers of, of getting your money, basically. If the music is consumed in another country, then there's an agency that picks up that money, then that agency gives it to your local agency. They charge a fee between themselves. That agency, the first agency charges a fee, then they charge a fee between themselves, then they charge you a fee, and then that's how you get your money. So I am so excited that Web3 is gonna figure out, and I'm sure it's not obviously long time coming, but um, I'm so excited to live in a world where the royalty collection is gonna be instant and it's just gonna be global instead of having to go through currency exchanges and, and different layers of agencies that are, that are taking money. So that's what excites me the most. I, I feel like solving these problems is definitely gonna build a more equitable world and it's gonna allow you to explore and enjoy music how you want. And also as a consumer, you're gonna know that your money that you are putting towards consuming music or the art that you love is actually going to the artists that you're, that you're going through instead of you know, kind of putting it out there and you don't know exactly where it's going. So that's what I'm excited about. Um, I would say I agree about um, collaboration will definitely help. Um, I also think if we somehow make resources more accessible, um, something that we do, sometimes we have spaces in different languages um, teaching about the basics of NFTs, but not just like French, Spanish, but, but like uh, Swahili, we've done Yoruba, we're going to do like many other different languages that are just from like uh, in Africa, from like very specific regions, we've done Arabic. So we're trying to make sure that everyone who wants to learn about Web3 is able to. And so I feel like if more people work to do that or maybe find someone who does speak that and knows about um, NFTs and you know helps uh, translate these resources, we can definitely get more people interested in Web3. Could you actually repeat the question? I forgot. <laughs> That's okay, you're the fourth person to answer, so the question kind of gets lost in broken telephone. Right. Um, I asked if, if uh, we could all kind of like dream up strategies for how um, we can, within this great creative ecosystem, within Web3, we can all collaborate and uh, be more universal in the way that we create together. Yeah, so uh, hearing that kind of like refresh, um, I'd say quadratic funding is cool. Um, it's kind of like outside of the VC uh, realm and, and nothing really succeeds without uh, funding. Uh, that's just the reality of the situation in terms of scalability, sustainability, that's something that we're struggling with. Uh, it's purely volunteerism based. Uh, we're actually negative 13 grand, uh, which is why I've been fundraising. Um, but how do you motivate a team of 10 people in our case, right? Like how do you get them to quit their full-time jobs? You know, some of them working two jobs, three jobs, right? Uh, as, you know, children of parents that were immigrants or immigrants themselves, right? Like residents and core team members on our team that are immigrants, right? Um, that have a lot of disadvantage in general. Um, so, you know, when it comes to collaborating, I feel like the idea of collaborating with your direct surroundings is the healthiest way to, to build. And I just say that from a hyper-localized standpoint um, because these are people that you know, uh, you've known for years, and you see the problems that they suffer from, um, which means at some point a solution will come, right? Um, so I think building ideally locally is, in my opinion, the fastest way, uh, fastest way to solve a problem. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, my opinion. And having these conversations together, too. Um, great. Okay. Thank you. I, you know, to to that point as well. I think that uh, also in Web three, again through this kind of Western narrative, we often hear people saying or people thinking that uh, you know Web three is is great for mar marginalized folks, uh, for developing countries. But I want to flip that narrative and ask you all like, why you think that Web3 needs participation from developing countries and marginalized communities. And I want to actually start with Steph, because I want to kind of disrupt the flow of how they we're answering questions. So it's funny. This was like the question I was most excited to answer, um, simply because I feel like we take for granted how stable our currency is here in the US and in Europe. 
Um, whereas like Latin America, that has not been the case at all. Um, I grew up and I, I'm hear, hearing of people literally buying dollars and storing them under their mattress because that was the only way they could retain the value of their local currency. Um, so that's what I think they could bring. There's like this fearlessness, right? They've already lived through like horrible currency winters and bear markets are completely defined a different way in, in these other countries. They're gonna, they're, they're just fearless. They're gonna invest in this and believe it and prop it up in the long term because they've seen that happen already with their own uh, local currencies. And the other thing is there's, in Latin America, we're used to um, just jerry-rigging things to work for us. Like, we don't necessarily know, like, if things are in English, we're like, okay, we'll figure it out. What does this mean? This means this and that. And so we've, we adapt words from English, throw them into our Spanish. Like, there's a whole controversy behind the word minting, and if we're gonna use minteo, or the correct word in Spanish would be acuñar, and there's like a whole fight. But we're used to doing these things, and as a result, we've just become very inventive. So there's a ton of resources being built. I'm really excited about what's happening in Argentina. I think there's a, a incredible talent coming out of there. They're building solutions. They're reworking projects. They're taking an idea and making it on themselves. And I'm excited about what, what's going to come from Latin America because of that. Um, yeah, I think I have like a similar answer. Um, I know a lot of artists like in Africa or certain countries in Africa, they're very resourceful. Um, they don't have the same access to some things. Some, I know people who have started their digital art using their finger on their iPhone, that kind of thing. People using VPNs in order to access Twitter, in order to be in Web3. So I think it's important to include these kind of people because they're very resourceful, uh, very hardworking, very talented. And personally, I would like someone like that on my team who is able to solve a problem um, like just like that. They just figure it out however they can and they're just willing to go to distance in order to achieve whatever their goal is. Great point. Uh, yeah. Um it's actually a point I wanted to make earlier. I'm so happy that you asked this question and, and just the responses that have been made before. But like, what, what happens when a currency is completely localized? It's not like union type stuff, but what happens when a group of 20, 30, 50, 100 people decide to say, okay, we're gonna create a collective co uh, currency. What happens if we create a local currency that our you know, government needs to respect? Our uh, you know, city government, our state government, our federal government, they have no choice. And so there's this bargaining power between a local collective and their currency um, and the superstructures that are around them. And so, you know, this flipping that, the pattern of the patterns that you're doing and the questions that you're asking us, like uh, what happens when we flip the value proposition of any collective or uh, marginalized community? They don't become marginalized anymore. They become uh, highly sought after because of their abilities or their services or their products or what have you. Um, so I think this technology is able to leverage that um, collective bargaining power uh, where we have the power to deploy smart contracts and create our own uh, you know, security uh, token uh, or utility token or uh, you know, membership token. And no one can say anything about it um, as long as we incorporate outside of certain countries that have limitations, uh, legally speaking. So. Uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting like space to to contemplate and, and think about. Cool. Yeah. Well, I love what you said about wanting the people to be on their team because I think that that for me is something that I think about because I think we need more people in leadership who are uh, coming from these backgrounds, such as all of ours uh, on this panel. You know, we should be in points of uh, of leadership because. You know, our lived experiences offers that to to our projects, and I think that uh, the more that we can do that, the more we can unlock for the people. I, I really love what you say about that localized community as well, um, because I think about this a lot with Genre, which is a, a record label out of LA, where sort of like a experimental label, all genre, and. Um, <laughs> we have we have our little community. You know, sometimes I look at we have this uh, uh, monthly uh, free public uh, good essentially that we throw first Saturdays in LA in a park, free music in the park, and um, 
you know, sometimes I, when I look out at the, at the community, there's like, you know, three to 500 people sometimes if it's like a crazy lineup and I'm just like, this is what the future of the music industry can be. It's like my hyper local community just supporting itself and like allowing these artists that we sign, or, you know, just work with, we don't really sign them or anything, you know, we don't, we're not like a traditional label where we own masters or anything like that. So um, it's just nice to see the, the future open up in different emergent ways. And so that's one of the things I'm really excited about in particular in the, in the you know, record label kind of music space as well. Awesome, yeah, lots to be said about music specifically. Um, and some of you are, are obviously talking about, um, right now, like Jack, you're, you're talking a lot about the future. And uh, I know presently right now, especially in the creative community, different parts of the world, different kind of miniature Web3 ecosystems are solving uh, problems using Web3 in different ways. Looking to the future within this creative space, what kind of solutions do you see Web3 bringing to the table? I'll just, I'll just keep it rolling with genre because I really, yeah, I'll just keep going with it. But the, the, it. the, the solutions I see in particular for the artists that we work with, I mean, these are artists that make everything from ambient music to footwork to, you know, R&B. There's like weird stuff on there. We, we value the weird. We love making space for the weird. So, you know, these, these are folks that never really get a shot in the mainstream. These are folks that never really get any mainstream attention. And so, you know, what, what this technology can unlock in particular for these artists is a chance, is a fair shot, is a, is a you know, support in a, in a way that they could never have otherwise imagined or hoped for. So that for me is like what one of the greatest unlocks that Web3 can offer is, uh, you know, support and not just, you know, not just globally, but also like in particular, these, uh, these artists that really are underrepresented uh, just in general, like across genre. I'm gonna double down on that on the seeing artists that are underrepresented and I'm just gonna add transparency. I think that's what most excites me about this whole thing is that right now there's a ton of NDAs that are keeping all this information hidden in, in, in a black box somewhere in the music industry and I, I'm excited about just things being out in the open and also having um, that connection, that direct connection with your artists and having it be both ways. Currently, it's very hard for you to see who your top listeners are, but you know, in a Web3 world, people will be able to see that. Um, you'll be able to reward, as an artist, you'll be able to reward your, your fans and you know, fans will be able to continue to participate in your ecosystem because of that. So I'm most excited about that transparency. What I spoke about earlier about royalty collection on chain, I think I truly believe it's gonna be the future and it's gonna revolutionize um, just so many things. It's gonna cut out a lot of middlemen, but I don't know that they're necessarily all gonna go away. Um, but yeah, those are the two things I'm most excited about. Um, I would say ownership. Um, I really like Manifold, especially because they're free, and so it's accessible to every single person. And I like that every time a new issue comes up, they're already working on like finding a solution. Like, you know, lately the whole royalties uh, conversation has been going on and people are, or platforms are trying to do the whole 0% royalty thing and like Manifold is already saying like they started working on a solution for that, which I really appreciate because I mean, that's what we were all told, you know, like, oh, that's why you should do NFTs and Web3 because of royalties. So I like the fact that we're gonna be able to own everything and earn like all the money that we deserve or that we were promised um, and that we've earned. Um, and then also I think the blockchain, like not in a creative sense, but I think the blockchain will be useful for things like voting or like, I don't know, medical records, that kind of thing. I think that would be amazing to see in the future um, so that there's no voter fraud or like, I don't know, tampering with records, that kind of thing. Um, that's something I'm looking forward to in the future. Yeah. Um... I think the future is like already here. Uh, personally, I, you know, you mentioned Manifold, which is like a great platform to to mention and articulate. Um, but also like Nasa Safe for Treasury management, like it's a really big deal. Like multi-signature wallets, just to see how funds are allocated, uh, that scares, um, you know, the shit out of you know multinational 
and the board and donors and uh, all the invisible strings attached to financing. Um, very successful uh, companies, legacy traditional companies, publicly traded companies. Um, so uh, yeah, I, you know, uh, LensTube, right, is another solution that already exists. I mean, you know, Lens is an incredible protocol. They're here, they're supporting um, this event. Um, Audius, right, that's already a platform that's fantastic. Uh, Sound.xyz, Mirror.xyz, like there's so many solutions that have already been deployed, it's just people don't know about them and they're still like skeptical. Um, so I think, again, going back to education and disseminating information and oversimplifying things uh, is critical, just so people are more aware that the change is already here and it's already happening, so yeah. Really quickly, to your point, uh, there actually is a couple of people that are, or a couple of uh, regions that are using the blockchain for transparency in uh, police reporting. Uh, in places with uh, high corruption, there's a city that has adopted it in India where you can actually trace your police report so you know that it hasn't been tampered with. Um, so these, you're right, these things exist, they're happening, like people are doing it, they just need to know about it. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, and to that point too, like Nicholas, you mentioned kind of like education. And with education, there's obviously a really important question of accessibility. And initially, the first question that I had asked you is like, who is Web 3.4? And you all essentially said cis white men uh, with money. <laughs> uh, how, what kind of onboarding strategies can we approach that are inclusive and open to people who are marginalized or uh, to people from like diverse backgrounds? What are kind of new ways, other than the obvious, that, that we can kind of bring people on board and educate and spread awareness? Ooh, I do, for genre, I literally do it one person at a time. I'll sit down with them and answer all their questions and help them set up their stuff. That's the best way to do it is in person, like small groups, one-on-one. -on -one. I know no, like people maybe not wanna hear that, but that is the best way to onboard because conversations are how we move the space forward, just like this, but less formal. <laughs> yeah, I agree. There's nothing better than, than the voice that you have. Um, I think a problem we have is that we continue to prop these same voices all the time. And we say, if you wanna get your information, go to this same person. And I think we're perpetuating this and therefore these voices just keep getting more and more powerful. Um, but what I've found is more effective is when you find kind of communities around what you believe in. I'm a parent, for example. And so I, I literally went to all the moms in like my son's music class and they asked me what I did and I said crypto and they're like, oh, we'd love to learn about it. I'm like, great, let's have a play date and we'll talk about it. You know, So it's like going to people where they're at and teaching them a little bit more about what this is. I never tell people you have to join because there's, there's a certain aspect of MLM fear that comes when, when you come at it that way. Um, but I just kind of tell them like, look, this is, this is some of the basics. If you're interested in learning more, I'm here for you. If not, um, there it is. But that was the most effective onboarding experience I think I had because we had that in common and they saw me as like, here's another mom, mom to mom, let's have this list talk. Um, and the mistake that we have is that I, I've seen in panels and everyone recommends like go talk and then go, go listen to this, another cis white man. And that's where some people kind of like get turned off because they don't see themselves in that story. So. Did the play date happen? It did, it did, yeah. The kids, the kids played and you know, we talked about it. I had my laptop on and you know, we talked about all these things. Um, one mom actually even ordered a ledger during the play date, so that was exciting. Mission accomplished, I love yep. it. Um, definitely onboarding, but onboarding during different time zones, not just the ones that cater to the US, uh, which would be very difficult, but I mean, you can partner with people who are in those time zones and um, help teach basic NFT classes or blockchain um, courses, something like that, but definitely gotta cater to people that are outside of our own time zones. Yeah, uh, there's a big confliction about this like cis white male um, kind of narrative because I actually entered this space with a female co-founder, um, Erica Gemma. She's a bit of a public figure nowadays uh, here in the Miami landscape. And um, it was purely volunteerism, right? There were two co-founders, uh, female-led, 
Um, it just the energy was amazing at the blockchain center, and and it fell through because of COVID the pandemic. There's a lot of issues because it's co-working space and an accelerator program. Um, but she introduced me to this cis white educator uh, called um, Andreas Antonopoulos. And for those of you that don't know who he is, he's an economist from Greece. So he witnessed the economy there collapse twice. And so he noticed trends and patterns. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot that we can learn from people regardless of the labels that we project onto them. Um, and, you know, we don't need to be allies, but kind of be agnostic, because uh, if we're looking at a transcription and the identity is anonymous, the information is still uh, there. But, uh, you know, to be fair, like, Erica is the reason why I got into crypto. And then, vicariously through her, she introduced me to someone that allowed for me to understand what a BTC maxi is. Like, you know, I, I bought my first crypto kitty secretly because my coworkers were BTC maxis and they would recommend BTC maxis. And so that's where I learned about like ETH and like uh, Polygon and, and uh, Cardano, it, you know. So I feel like there's a gateway of learning and that's subjective to each person and the path uh, that they take and what manifests on their path. Um, but there's something to be learned by everyone uh, we just can't idolize. I think idolization is like a very dangerous thing. Um, and celebrityism, we should kind of veer away from that and learn something from everyone in a collective or in a community. So, yeah. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about this space is that everybody has their own origin story of how they first got involved. Um, and that's a very good point. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I also uh, want to do a little bit of a 180 because a topic that I think is relevant to this discussion uh, is kind of uh, how we can curb corporate hypercapitalist ideals within the space. And I think we see this the most in the music industry. And Steph, I'm looking at you when I say this. Uh, but we see it a lot in music where we have um, you know, DIY, independent artists enter the space. And then we also have the majors that are investing so much capital. It seems like every day there's a new investment that they're making um, in the space too. So I'm wondering, where is the fine line between these major institutions, these major companies coming in versus this more of a kind of like a DIY collectivist for the people state of mind? It's, so it's not a secret to people in the industry and in the big labels what it takes to succeed in Web3. The problem is they just don't have the bandwidth and the resources. So everything that they're doing, even though it has a ton of money, it hasn't really had like a huge effect. Like it maybe got a headline on Billboard because of the connections they had, but then in the long term it didn't really do much. So they're not really building effectively, and it's because they need the bandwidth, the resources, and the time, and it takes a lot of time to grind, educate yourself, educate a whole team. Everyone needs to learn. The artist needs to be on board 100%, so it's, it's very rare. I mean, there's, there's a few projects out there that are, that are happening. They're kind of hobbling along, but I don't, I don't know what's happening, and it's very reminiscent of me working a single, and basically we just throwing as much money as we can to it, and it just wasn't working, and at the end of the day, it was like, it wasn't connecting with the fans, we, can, we need to stop dumping money into this, and let's move forward. And that's what it kind of feels like it's happening from, from the major side. They will figure it out eventually, but I think right now they're going about it with like, you know, using a, a hammer to, you know, basically <laughs> put down a feather, that's, that's what they're doing, because they're signing big deals, just to, just to say they're participating in the space, because that's a cool thing to do, and that's, it's the same thing that happens with e anything new. Even with TikTok, they were like, well, we're talking to TikTok, but they couldn't figure out how to make anything viral on TikTok. I don't think they still, anyone knows how to do that yet. Um, so, so, I mean, I, I'm obviously, I, I know they're gonna come, they're gonna figure it out, because it always happens. People with a ton of money and resources make it happen, but it's not happening right now. It's not connecting. So that's, that's a silver lining, I think, right now for everyone who's doing DIY and, and doing things differently. Um, you know, and the, and the only negative to that is that labels are seeing what is working and they're gonna copy that. And that's, that's basically what's, what's gonna happen. And it's, there's no way to prevent that. I mean, it's, everything is out in the open on the blockchain. It's happening already. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone wanna add to that?
about how we can um, create a balance right oh, now. Yeah. Right. I wanted to talk about that because I'm at Polygon. <laughs> and there's quite a few announcements that have been made. And so some of the work that I do, especially with these big names, these big household themes, is uh, anytime they get a resource from me, the first page is, you got to invest in DEI from day one. So, and beyond that, my playbook, it reads pretty much like my ethos, my heart on my sleeve. You know, I'm telling them all of these old Bitcoin adages and, and telling them they need to, you know, go, 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 like giving them their little like resource uh, sort of a, a, a playbook so that they have some idea of how to do it, how to, how to do it correctly and what the ethos of the space is. That's the most important part is that a lot of what I do in terms of community with Polygon is the ethos teaching. And I have to tell you, I, we've said like, not we, but like, projects have been turned away from other big household names because they don't want to commit the time. They, are, they, don't, they either don't understand why people would just, why wouldn't they just want to buy this thing from me? And it's like, no, that's not what this space is about. There's a little bit more, like why would, any, why would anyone want to buy this thing from you? Really though, if you're not offering anything else, why would anyone, why would, you, why would anyone want to buy that? And so they have this, this mind shift sort of thing to do and it's not for everyone and people are not ready, but you know, for the, for the brands that want to enter the space, you know, at least for the purists out there, <laughs> they can be like rest assured that uh, at least, uh, you know, Polygon is kind of teaching the ethos as much as possible, you know, for those who are willing to listen. So I think those projects will be more successful uh, who take that advice and the ones who don't will continue to fizzle. They're, they're, not, they're, not, val they're not value adding to the space. That's what we tell them. It was like, if you're not willing to commit the time to do this and like really offer something to your community, like there's no value add to our chain, you know, if you do something, so. You've got to you've got to be about it. <laughs> yeah, and have have purpose. Absolutely, have purpose. it's an intentional place, especially at these emergent early stages. We have to be intentional because that is how we establish what will move forward. And so, if we stick to our guns and really, you know, hold on to that ethos, just like we hold on to those assets and bear markets, you know, like we really got to hold on to everything right now and just keep moving forward slowly. I love uh, using the terminology of ethos in this context. I think that that's really beautiful and, and poetic. Speaking of which, uh, what in the space right now are you all finding um, to be really kind of like impactful and, sp and inspiring in the work that you're doing in various creative capacities? Tying into this idea that Jack just brought up of intention um, are there any projects or is there anything that you've seen or any ideas, protocols, et cetera, et cetera? You're nodding. I see you nodding, Nicholas. Yeah. Um, this is a great question. Uh, in Miami in particular, for those of you that know, uh, gentrification, just like in most major cities when there's a lot of tourism, is like a real thing. Um, and then obviously city planning, uh, railroad tracks, uh, highways are used as divisions between low income uh, and high income. And so it's built into the civic engineering of the city, uh, which is systemic racism essentially. So there's a lot to deconstruct when it comes to the current systems that are operating. Um, I think it's cool to look at projects that are addressing those problems. I also think it's cool uh, and it's very inspirational to see what other cities are doing that have already gone through these booms and bust cycles. Uh, I was talking to DeForest Brown uh, after the Matmo show uh, in New York, literally one of the smartest people on this planet, um, him and his partner. And you know, he was talking about like living in New York after a major flood, right? After like a major natural disaster. And it forced community to actually talk to each other and to help each other and actually deploy mutual aid. And so I think that's a very inspirational story because um, it doesn't matter like 
if you're on the north side or the south side of the highway or the railroad track, you're going to help each other out because you're brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter like what your demographic is. You're going to help each other because you need help. You need a light. You need like uh, you know a torch. You need food. You need beans. You need water. So uh, I think that's incredibly inspirational. I also think um, certain things like Soda Club in London, where uh, you know you get a group of 30 people, just as an example, in a city, and they contribute $100 a month to a space, and then they have access to one event uh, in that month. What happens? What happens with real estate? What happens with collectivism? What happens with enabling these technologies in our favor? Um, so I'm constantly inspired personally every day with the independent research that I do because um, there's just so much happening and there's so much to learn on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, there's so many projects. Yep, yep. Um. One that I like, or one that um, I admire, is there's um, a group called Nija Flood Aid. There was a flooding in some parts of Nigeria, and so artists that lived there came together and started like a fund and um, put art on sale in order to raise funds to help people that were caught in the flood. Because unfortunately, the government wasn't going to do much about it, so like they just took it upon themselves um, and they put it out there in order to raise money. Um, so I like things like that. I also like um, Accelerate Art. I'm a member of Accelerate Art. And it, basically we create opportunities for emerging artists. Um, and it has people like Claire Silver, Ruben Wu, like different bigger names. But when it comes to curation, we're always looking for emerging artists. Um, just like the Scope show that's happening, we're able, all of us were able to nominate one emerging artist to show there. And you know, that's kind of a major deal when you're um, an emerging artist, so it just it makes me feel good to create opportunities or to help change someone's life, even if it's in a small way like that. But um, I just like seeing things like that in the space. Um, well, I said I was I was excited about what's happening in Argentina. There's a lot coming from Argentina, but um, two things that have excited me a lot is one, I discovered a community of artists from Cuba, and in Cuba because they're not able to, to access ETH. They basically have built just a whole community in Tezos. And there's amazing, amazing work there. Um, there's some tracks that are beautiful. And I'm, I was very, very lucky to be able to curate one of those artists into catalog. And so she had her first ETH Mint on there. And that was amazing. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm excited about because it takes a lot of inventiveness, especially in Cuba. One, to have reliable internet. Um, two, to acquire crypto. And then three to just basically record it and put it out there and you know for this piece that she put on catalog it literally took her 24 hours of trial and error because her internet was not reliable the file kept getting corrupted all of these things and these issues but she got it up there and it sold and so that's already a significant thing so i'm very excited about her her name is yax castillo y-a-x-x -X, um and then castillo c-a-s-t-i-l-l-o um so yeah definitely check her out and I'm, I'm really excited about what's coming out of Cuba right now. Uh, yeah, yesterday I just learned about a, a project called Canna Foundation. And what they do is they uh, regenerate the earth via rehorsing and uh, restoring the, the natural grasslands for horses and working with indigenous uh, communities and, uh, you know, native land and rehorse, like, uh, Re repopulating the horse community because otherwise, um, I didn't know this, but uh, apparently the government pays to round up wild horses uh, and throws them into smaller pens and uh, so that they can make more land for agriculture and like uh, horrible agricultural practices go on, you know, because of it. So what they're, what they're doing is they're working on legislation, they're working on, uh, you know, working with natives in their native land to like rehorse these, these wild horses. But the interesting part of it is that they, they, their NFT drop was actually done by a local rapper. And so it has like nothing to do with horses. And I'm like so excited by this. I was like, you mean I can buy this song and support horses? Like that is the future is where like you 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 have this creative you pair this creative with this like sustainability or this like crazy project that like adds value and regenerates the earth that is what i'm 
so excited about. Like, I can't wait to like buy music and also be regenerating the earth at the same time. That's the future. And it's crazy that that's not already possible. It's. I mean, they did it. It's. It's possible. We just gotta. We just gotta pair up the sustain. Like I. I <laughs> I told one uh, NFT, big NFT um, group, let's say, uh, I was like, you know what you should do? Because <laughs> I'm always trying to influence people just in conversation. I was like, you should, you should think about like one or two percent of your secondary sales going to some sustainability cause. Like just, just, a, little, just a little bit, just a little bit. But you know, people are fighting over royalty percentages already, so obviously they didn't ha go for it, but in my mind's eye, I was like, we should just offer some sort of regenerative thing in every NFT. That's just my own personal opinion, but. That can be part of your personal onboarding Yeah, I process. gotta do, I gotta, I gotta write a protocol real fast. I'll be right back. <laughs> I wanna uh, open up the floor for questions, but before I do that, I want to ask each of you a question that kind of relates back to the overall framing of this discussion. And I'm curious to know from each of your perspectives what a creatives first decentralized internet looks like to you. And you can dream big. I think this is like interconnected with like everything that we've been discussing on this panel, but. Um I would say nodes that are anonymously held by members uh, of that community. Uh, community currency, uh, that's another, another point. Uh, Multi-signature wallets for treasury management, on-chain voting, so all that's public. Uh, yeah, there's so many things. I could list like maybe 20 or 30 things off the top of my head. Uh, but that's what it looks like. I, you know, I feel like you know, open calls, grant programs, like incubators, think tanks, like with no nationalistic agenda, like, um, yeah, there's so much. It depends on everyone's perception, right? That subjective perception, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a loaded question, but yeah, it's, it's exciting um, in terms of what that looks like for me, but also what that looks like for other builders in the space, which would be totally different, right? Um, but yeah, I'd say all those, all those points, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, he basically said everything that I would want to say, but yeah, um, more funding so we can, you know, discover new ideas. You have no idea what we can accomplish because some people just don't have the money. So if we can just get access to more funding, I think the possibilities are endless. For me, I kind of want to make, build a world where artists and musicians are able to hire out services a la carte. I feel like right now the only way to get services is to sign to a label or to sign to a distributor, but it would be great for an artist to just basically pick and choose exactly what they need. You know, if you want to hire someone to pitch out your music to be synced in movies, just hire them out and, you know, pay at an unaffordable rate. If you need to, you know, deal with arbitration because there's a dispute over copyright, like just go over there and hire it instead of having to tie themselves to a big entity. So that's what I'm most excited about and of course transparency. Yeah, all of these are incredible uh, points. And I think the only thing I can add to that is that I'm really excited to have these hyper-local, uh, like, again, the hyper-local thing, though, that's another, that's another word that's been coming up a lot. But these hyper-local things and connecting that globally is what's super exciting to me. Um, because, you know, you can find those in your area that are like-minded, but then you can also expand your horizons by opening up this global channel. So really excited to connect global and local in order for all of us to work together and understand everyone's needs. And not to be siloed in the process. No. No silos. No silos. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? Okay. We're recording this, so I'm going to pass you the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the conversation. I think it's uh, really important. All of these are super important topics. Um, but I was wondering, like, uh, what do you all think about, like, um, you know, how to include also, like, um, you know, the trans community, you know, queer communities, non-binary people, you know, all this part of society that's uh, pretty futuristic on itself. You know, these are identities from the future and creating like art that sometimes, you know, comes from the future as well. So. It's not only that they would add so much value, but these are identities that are like 
you know, non-existent almost today. So I was just wondering, you know, what do you all think about that? How can we help include them? And yeah, that. Great question, thank you. For sure, yeah. I actually do a lot of just personal work um, around that, uh, especially as a queer femme myself, so it's something that's very important. But um, I see that, you're, it's interesting that you say like it's a new emergent identity because I feel like it's also ancient. Uh, there's indigenous cultures in uh, like the Oaxaca area that celebrate the third gender, which is essentially like the trans gender. <laughs> and, and, and so, um, you know, connecting with folks who have always identified like that and it just, just now maybe it's allowed to be out in the open. Um, but that's something that I think about all the time and I'm working constantly with different communities, uh, Prism Collective, Mutual Love, 50, uh, 50 Millimeter Collective, like these are some, in it, like specifically Web3 collectives that I'm you know, associated with, in touch with, or, or try to uplift you know, via other platforms that I have. Um, because I think it's extremely important for others to know that there are, you know, you can express yourself any way you want. And I love the blockchain and its decentralized nature because I think that uh, it's, it, its queerness is rejection of the norms. And so I love the, the blockchain's queer, y'all. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Anytime there's like a new technology or a new terminology added to language, that's like the perfect Trojan horse to like just say, everyone else, come along. And, um, and, th and that's what it is, right? And I think it's the same thing. It's like the Spanish language, for example, is very gendered. But all of a sudden, because there's all these new terms coming in because of this new technology, I'm seeing more and more people kind of adapting to like, oh, okay, now we're using another term to mean everyone. So um, that's what I'm most excited about it. I definitely think it, it should be inclusive. And when we say inclusive, we mean all the communities. But I think this is sort of like a good opportunity for us to like sneak everyone else in and make sure we're all inclusive in, in this new world. I, yeah, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, Latine is like the one that emerged in my mind recently that I didn't, I, before I was Latinx, which I didn't like, Latine is like, that I prefer. Exactly, yeah. so a lot of people are using Latine or like instead of saying chicos, they're saying chiques, and so that's kind of become the thing, you know, and, and to me it's really exciting to see that it's just, because we're also building culture as well as technology, it's the people that are coming in are saying, oh, even if, if they have some trepidation or confusion, they're like, oh no, that's, that's how we play here, so I must adapt, and I've, I've noticed that a lot of people are adapting a lot faster because of it. Um, I definitely think we need to onboard more black trans women because, um, you know, their lives are very, um, I don't know what the proper, basically they're in danger every day. Um, and like when I did the women's show in March, I was only able to find one because my friend told me about um, an artist named Chrissy. And I even asked her, I'm like, do you know any others? And she's like, no. And I feel like it would be very beneficial to have more black trans women just because on Twitter you see a lot of like GoFundMes and things like that. I feel like because crypto had such a horrible reputation before, maybe that's why we don't see more, but um, maybe we can take the time to onboard more um, in order to help them get the funding that they need, you know, just to live their everyday lives. And maybe Chrissy can be that thought leader for that community. And, and that's where I said the same thing. It's like we need to see people who are educating that look like you, and maybe that's why there isn't enough. Yeah, this is a, a fantastic point, especially in a place like Miami. Um, I'm really happy that you asked this question. At MCR, we have uh, kind of like a privilege for individuals that apply and a priority uh, that are queer, a POC, and uh, you know, we review applications as a team. We have 30 applications that we have yet to accept. Um, because of the influx of, of people wanting to join uh, from the community, but we do give priority to those individuals because, you know, like we have a culture here, at least, you know, people between the age of 20 and 30, uh, you know, maybe even 35 and 18, where we have now, thanks to GAMI um, and, you know, Ultra Them and Internet Friends and Masisi with uh, Pressure Point. Uh, we, we have incredible local leaders that are pushing this narrative of supporting um, the queer uh, space. And even Victor uh, with autonomy. So these are all individuals locally that, you know, some of them have HBO documentary features and have put themselves on the map. 
um, for their accomplishments for representing these under marginalized communities here locally in Miami. Um, but we're deeply inspired and continue that legacy that they started uh, and even people before them. Even with Diego, Diego from SAFE, um, a legend uh, with the parties that he threw, um, with DJ Sprinkles, right, trans, uh, so important. Thank you for bringing it up, yeah. Yeah, great question, thank you. No, we had a question over here. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for like all of your awesome like and perspectives and answers to all these questions. This is like one of the most exciting I think panels that I've seen so far. Um, one question I had was, I guess you all do some work maybe with entities who don't necessarily understand or share um, the same ethos yet. So I'm curious, like what specific approaches or strategies beyond what you've already shared that you kind of use to like protect your communities from maybe like, I feel like extractive inclusion and DEI efforts. Um, I think that'd be my question. Another great question. Okay. I just, I just tell them. <laughs> I, I really just give it to them straight. Like I said before, like I really, I think I think it means more coming from me too because I'm serious about it. And so, uh, because I, they see that I'm very passionate about it, you know, they, they, you know these entities that may not understand, uh, I, I try to either make them understand or you know, we kind of walk away from it. It's, it's, it's not really, like I said, if it's not adding value to the overall platform, then why do it? So, um, really, again, sticking to the, to the points that I'm passionate about and uh, what we need in order for us to progress uh, is is all of those is all of those points. So that's that's something that is very very um, very near and dear to my heart. Uh, so they can't. There's no compromise there. <laughs> and for me, when I've worked with artists that are very well established, that want to enter into the space, the first thing I do is I tell them, let's sit down and start building your collection. Because um, once they realize all the steps that it takes to do that. Um, then they can understand that that same level of commitment needs to be returned in order for you, you to build a community there. Um, a lot of these artists have said, no, I just want to come here and worth my money. And you know, that's where I kind of say, well, you're, one, it's not going to work. Two, it's not going to last very long. So I just pretty much walk away. But, but the first thing I do is I, I put them on the consumer chair and I say, sit down. Let's build your collection. What is it that you like? How long is it going to take for you to discover things? How are you going to discover new artists, which is also super time consuming right now because we don't have great discoverability tools just yet. Um, and so with that, I'm usually, that usually pretty much weeds out the people that are not, that are not well intentioned. Um, we, African NFT community, we have a lot of people that want to work with us just because it would be a good look to work with us. And so um, our team, we always ask the questions like, okay, who retains ownership of the artwork? How much are you taking? Are you gonna promote it? You know, like what exactly is the benefit for the artist? Because if it benefits you more than it benefits the artist, then what's the point? Like, why are you coming to us other than to look like, oh, hey, we know some black people or something like that, you know? So yeah, you definitely have to ask the hard questions. And then if they pass all those, We'll then present it to the community, but even then we're like, okay, everyone, like, be careful and make sure you really think about it before you decide that you want to work with this company. Because just because it's a big company doesn't mean, like, I don't know, doesn't mean that it's worth it. Like, don't be desperate, you know, for an opportunity because it might end up hurting you more than helping you in the end. Yeah, uh, I'd say it's really conflicting in general working with traditional web two or for-profit or non-profit institutions, especially in this space, uh, when it comes to partnerships or collaborations, because they just don't get it, and they don't really want to get it. They don't want to talk about it. Um, they just want to see metrics. They want to see turnarounds. They want to see returns. Um, like Numerophiliac, I think that's like the name of that. Um, which devalues projects and what people are building and what they're putting their heart and their soul into. Um, but so, yeah, I would say it's really conflicting in general. 
any partnership that you may have with major organizations that have different interests from you, and it's a case-by-case -case basis, uh, really has to do with the roundtable discussion and like negotiating terms and what makes sense to both sides. Um, if not being direct is ideal, where it's like, this partnership is not gonna work out. Like, as much as we think that it will, it won't, because you're too interested in your investors taking X amount, or you wanna to extract too much culture um, from our city. And so, I was recently told by someone that has a very successful DAO, like, your community is a product. And like, my, my stomach like, irked, and it was, it was wise advice, you know, and the intentions were true, and he's a product guy, but like, that's not, that's not what we are, we're not a product, we're beyond that, right? So um, working with entities like that, it's kind of like taking the best and leaving the rest, um, especially because we're so early. Um, so yeah, navigating that space isn't easy and it just requires effective communication um, and creating those boundaries where uh, people don't cross uh, you know, philosophical and ethical lines. Great point. I think we have time for one more. Ooh. Um, so you mentioned the thing about metrics, which is something I feel like I deal with in work a lot and getting people to be less focused on that. So I guess from your perspective for your communities, like what would you want people to be looking at beyond just like the numbers and like considering and caring about? I would say interconnectedness and like how valuable their their person to person relationships are and taking a pulse of that that's going to be the real metric of how healthy your community is and how well you can uh, sort of manage the volatility that comes with the space. And, you know, having a resilient community is essential in any WIMP3 project that is being run the correct way, you know? Um, so, yeah, I, that's, that's definitely how I would approach that. There's just some really, really great stories. And you know, I really believe in the power of storytelling. And for me, that's, that's what I tell people to focus on. Because metrics can be, I mean, I come from a record label life where we, like, we would man manicure metrics to make it seem like it was amazing, like the best female Latin, and like just add more qualifiers to make it, you know, I've done that before. We've cooked you know, to make it seem amazing. And, and it's a great marketing tool. But at the end of the day, if you don't have a great story, you're not going to be able to back it up. So. That's, that's what I believe in. Um, I would like for people to just focus on the art, but I mean, that's even why our community was founded because last year when we were all on Clubhouse, you know, people were kind of discriminating against people who have accents or because they're from certain regions, that kind of thing. So that's why we like banded together in order to like create opportunities for ourselves. But it would be nice if people just focus on the fact that they're very talented, creative people that like just so happen to come from somewhere different than when you, um, from where you do. Yeah, I mean, all the points that were made articulate uh, my same sentiment. I would also say like referral systems or uh, vetting systems where someone that's trusted can say, you know, this individual has put X amount of years, has done these types of projects, has done these services, that just expedites a lot of trustlessness uh, that we see in general, both in traditional structures and in you know, Web3. So I think, yeah, referral systems could also be a solution, yeah. Great, last call for a question. Hi, thank you all so much for this amazing discussion. Great moderation, Sarah, also. Um, so I'm from Water Music, and tomorrow we're doing a curation roundtable that is not Web3 focused, but I wanted to bring it up with you all because curation is like one of the hottest buzzwords that's being thrown around right now. You know, how do we um, sift through all the noise that's being created? I think a lot of people, almost like every week, there's a new tweet or new debate about like, oh, curation is just gatekeeping. Are we, you know, are we recreating a lot of the same like uh, kind of inequalities, kind of lack of access to opportunity that we're seeing with, um, I guess I focus on music, so like Spotify, you know, labels, how major labels at least, how they, I guess, curate talent. So I'm curious how you, given you all are artists, creators are working with artists um, in Web3, um, I imagine you all are doing some kind of curatorial work in that process, so how do you think about curation um, in a Web3 native way, if, if that's how you think about it, or if there are through lines from kind of earlier technologies, earlier decades. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sherry. Thank uh, you. Yeah, so it's, I, lo I love that you talk about curation because we talk a lot about that in genre, because um, our, our community is so 
they're incredible curators. You know, they, 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 I, they're really blown away. We have a, a channel where you plug your stuff and the music that they're making and the music that they're selecting and like we have another channel for just what you're listening to and it's just like incredible. So in, like we've been talking about it, the core members in the DAO, like how do we harness the power of curation in our community that, you know, and so one of the things that we're going to probably be forking is a uh, public assembly, which is a Zora protocol um, that'll, do, that'll allow uh, on-chain curation. But what we're going to fork specifically because we want our community to also thrive and, you know, reap the benefits of their curation. So uh, the, the, the contingent uh, that we'll put on that protocol is the... Um, We'll, we'll have a portion of the creator, or the, the curator who um, selected these works and was discovered these works, so they'll, they'll also get a percentage of that, uh, just a little sliver of something, um, you know, especially if someone has bought it and it's sort of like the referral system, like the on-chain referral system, so, um, yeah, that's something I think about with the curation, because our community, is, I'm always so impressed by the things they put together, um, yeah. Um, so I actually think curation as gatekeeping might be a good thing if you use it as a force for good. And for me, I see curation as like what is missing in the landscape, like what's not there and how can we, can we fill in those boxes. Um, kind of see it a little bit like affirmative action, you know, like if we can take a curation in that, in that aspect and then try to get more representation of, you know, trans people, people of color, you know, femme individuals, that's, that's what I think I think it, it could be used as a force for good. The issue comes when it's, when it's still kept in that same kind of world where it's the same people, the same audiences, that have the same resources, and they just keep kind of basically curating each other. You know, if you see a list and it has the same name every week, then is it really curation or is it just, you know, is, is it just the person pushing their own interests? So that's, that's what I, I think curation can be used as a gatekeeping tool, but for good as well. Um, I think... Well, I like to mix up curation, or we like to mix up curation um, in our community. And sometimes it'll be one person, but then sometimes we'll do it as a team to um, so that people can offer different perspectives or someone can introduce us to an artist we never heard of. But then we also do open calls um, in order to discover other artists because, I mean, like you said, like who wants to keep seeing the same names over and over again? So it can be gatekeeping, but if you're willing to do the work to find like new artists, then it can be like an amazing opportunity for different artists. Yeah, um, we actually talk about this a lot uh, in our community here in Miami, primarily because venues are closing, like a lot of them, and there's hyper monopolization of opportunities, and it becomes very political very quickly. So someone starting off needs to conform for 10 years, maybe even be an employee, in order to have the same privileges as someone that's been around for five, six years, right? So it's a very tricky subject to address, especially if you're empathetic and you see from both sides, right? Um, I would say that we need to consider the intentionality as to why gatekeeping is taking place in the first place, right? If you're in, let's just say, central Florida, right, or north Florida, which we know is xenophobic for the most part and very different from Miami, I'm not gonna generalize in these, these places, maybe gatekeeping or uh, curating is a feature of safety and protection against outside uh, predatorial energies, right? The problem, like what you mentioned earlier, is when it's leveraged and curation and gatekeeping is used to perpetuate the same narrative in different iterations, there's like a bottlenecking of talent and like a dam that fills with wood eventually needs to be unclogged and you have this abundant community filled with talent, which is what MCR pretty much is providing as an on-ramp. Um, but it's so overwhelming that the industry can't keep up because of the venue closures, right? Um, Las Rosas, Churchill's, Grand Central, ATV Records, all these legendary landmark venues um, 
displace artists. So they go to New York, they go to Chicago, they go to Paris, they go all these places. The culture is totally different and they do it because of their careers. So this is a very controversial topic in Miami in particular, uh, especially if you're empathetic towards both sides. Um, I would just say treading lightly is, is really important and trying to find value from both narratives and finding a middle ground is, is, uh, is critical, um, but with the right ethical uh, you know, drivers. That's, that's what I would, I would say, yeah. Thank you, and thank you for that wonderful question, Cherry. Uh, on that note, we're gonna wrap things up, but I just wanna thank you for such an insightful conversation. So many key takeaways uh, off the top of my head, the importance of having intent in participating in the space, uh, inclusive onboarding, and uh, that the blockchain is queer. <laughs> so thank you so much. And at 5 p.m. we have a special poetry reading in here. Yeah. And then tomorrow we have two AI roundtables, one on curation, one on creation, and they'll be starting at noon tomorrow in this space. Okay. Thanks.